Hi there, I'm Dustin Sager, and I am the author of Blame This Book, and it's about workplace toxicity and how we can rescue our workplace from that toxicity and from scapegoating. My uh, best advice that I'd ever received, I would say, is to never burn any bridges. So basically when you um, decide you don't want to be in a workplace anymore and you're moving on, to, uh, to you know, not burn those bridges behind you because you never know when uh, that can circle back on you. Ooh, that's interesting. Well, I learned burn the ships, man. There's <laughs> going back, but you're going to say don't burn the bridges, Dustin. So how, how did, uh, you know, how has that helped you? How has that served you? Yeah, so, um, you know, as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not a young pup. So I've uh, been through a few different uh, jobs and a few different career moves. And so I've had, you know, it's always the case that, you know, it's, it's a small world. And so whenever you're moving on to that next stage of your career or even two or three steps further down that journey, you never know when somebody is going to give you the opportunity uh, to, you know, find a new, new opportunity for your job, uh, create new avenues, give you a referral, and uh, you don't want to have burned those bridges at that point. So uh, people, even if you feel like somebody's done you wrong, uh, most people feel like they're just trying to do the best that they can. They're not typically trying to inflict damage on somebody else. And, uh, and so even if that was the case, people also, I believe people change and they have the opportunity to do better later in life. So in that case, uh, they could, you know, if you haven't burned that bridge, they may have come to a place where they've realized they did something wrong and they're willing to, you know, be an advocate for you at that point instead. That's interesting. So, well, in reading your book, you've had some interesting partnerships that didn't always go well. So none of those bridges got burned by you? No, I don't think so. I don't think any of those bridges were burned. Awesome. Awesome. That that takes a strong human being in order not to burn bridges when people do you wrong. So that's uh, good for you, man. Good for you. Well, I got so, good advice early on. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. That's great. So, so congratulations on the book, Blame this book that's fantastic right rescuing your workplace culture from toxicity and scapegoating that's super interesting so when i have to tell you though when i read about the history of the scapegoat it was super interesting to me so help us understand the history because i think that does a good job of framing where we're going to talk about this conversation Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we use that term, we throw it around a lot, the idea of a scapegoat. And most people know what we're talking about, that somebody typically is, you know, getting unfairly blamed in a situation. Uh, but there, there actually was a, an actual scapegoat in history. And you have to go into the, um, what, you know, Christians would call the Old Testament or, um, you know, the Torah of, um, you know, the uh, Jewish culture. And, Within that, we have the story of uh, Moses and the, the high priest was Aaron at that time leading the Israelites. And they actually took, they had a ritual, an annual ritual every year where they would take a goat and they would place, symbolically place the sins of their culture, uh, their society on the head of that goat. And then they would send it out into the wilderness at that point. And the idea was that it was taking all of their sin at that time and removing it from their society, right? And so that was actually, you think about it and you're like, well, you know, taking a goat, sending out in the wilderness where it, it may die might be considered inhumane at this point. But for that period of time, uh, it was actually more humane because when uh, the historian uh, Rene Girard looked at societies throughout, you know, way back in the ancient cultures, he saw that that was actually not done with animals, but it was done with people a lot of times. And what, and what it really, he said within like nearly every society that he saw this, that there would be conflict that would rise up. And so there'd be groups of people fighting with each other and conflict would start to spread throughout a society. And what the leaders of that society decided was, we're going to pick somebody who typically is going to be somebody of you know low status, maybe you know a wandering traveler, you know it could be a beggar, somebody who has a disease or something. And we're going to say, hey, all of this conflict and strife that's happening in our society right now, it's this person's fault. And society would agree, yes, that is that's the case. Now we're going to take them and we'll, we're going to either you know ostracize them or they might even kill that person. 
and that was a human scapegoat at that point. And what that would do is it would take people and it was a, what Rene Girard called a scapegoat mechanism. And it would all of a sudden you would say, oh, okay, so this violence that we're enacting against each other, we're going to take all that violence and we're just going to place it on one person in order to get rid of it. But it's not an actual solution. It was really just uh, kind of a stopgap solution because eventually those tensions would rise again and you'd have to do the same thing over and over. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I think uh, sending a, sending a goat out into the wilderness is far kinder than sending me out in the wilderness. So <laughs> I appreciate that, Dustin. That's uh, right. that's good stuff, right? <laughs> right. And our goal is that we're not doing this to people and we're not doing it to animals, but uh, my, you know, kind of the whole idea why he's like, why is the book called Blame This Book? You know, and that's the reason why it's like we need, we what shows us is that all these societies are doing this because they need a place to put that blame. And my idea is that it's more symbolic than it is anything else. And so if you could symbolically take that blame and put it on, and I'm saying just blame this book, right? If you could symbolically do that, it gives you a place to put it. And you say, well, it doesn't make sense to put it on a book. Does it make sense to put it on an innocent person? Does that make more sense, possibly? You know what I'm saying is like psychologically, if we can take that and we remove that emotional component, then we're able to focus on the real issue and get to the root cause of the problems that we're having. Wow. Wow. So I, I, that's powerful, right? It doesn't matter what we have the blame on. If it makes no sense, just pick something, right? Blame, blame your book, blame whatever. But where did you, where, like, what prompted you to write this book, Dustin? Yeah, so I had gone through a workshop and I had started uh, doing some um, writing kind of pithy ideas and uh, put them together and started looking at, okay, I've been kind of writing these and posting them out, you know, to the social media for several months. And I started thinking, hey, there's a common thread that's in here. And I have a, my career has spanned a lot of uh, different creative roles. I've worked in advertising agencies. I've worked in consulting roles. Um, I've you know done a lot of work with uh, television as well. And so as I've worked in these different mediums and different uh, environments, you know, and worked with creativity, it's always been a fascination of mine. You know, how do you get um, the most creativity out of the people that you're working with that, that are working for you? And how do you as an inv individual bring that creativity to your work as well. And so that was a common thread that was in a lot of what I was writing at that time. And I started realizing that, you know, you're, we're trying to overcome fear a lot of times. And, and that's a very cliche statement. And so when you try to drill down deeper into that, you're trying to overcome the fear of failure, right? And, but at the same time, there's a lot of organizations that they're not, nobody's batting a thousand, right? Nobody has a hundred percent success rate. So these organizations that are highly creative, they've created an environment where failure is more acceptable. And so what is it that they're doing? And so as I really dug into that, I realized what they're, one of the things that they're doing is they're not creating any blame on the back end of those failures. Right. And so they, they create acceptable failure, failure where you can learn from it. They're realizing that, you know, there are certain risks that you have to take in a business environment, and some of those are acceptable. And so when people work within that framework, then they're able to support them in taking risks and sometimes failing, but they're not attaching that blame element to it. And so then I started looking at, you know, okay, so what are people doing to encourage and support creativity? What are they doing to avoid, you know, uh, creating a blame culture within their organizations and how can we take that blame habit that seems to be in every one of us and turn that around? How can we as individuals avoid that blame habit, avoid blaming ourselves, avoid blaming others? And then as individuals in the workplace and as leaders in workplaces, how can we avoid that blame culture that then suppresses people's ability to not only be creative, but also to be innovative to, and to try new things and to you know, really bring great ideas to the table, to be able to engage in the work that they're doing. There's a lot of surveys out there. Gallup does a survey that shows that typically if you have one third of your workforce that's engaged, then you're doing pretty well. And that's a really low bar. But worldwide, they're seeing that 
you know, typically it's two thirds of the workforce that isn't engaged. And some of them are what they call actively, about one third is actually actively disengaged and they are working against what the organization is trying to do. So it's in the best interest of, you know, leaders and organizations and in the best interest of employees as well to help create this environment where we can avoid blame and we can create a, a healthier work, work culture. Wow. Wow. So, so talk, talk to me, cause in your book, you, you make this pretty clear, right? The difference between blame and responsibility is a big one. And I think a lot of organizations, they, they messed it up, right? They're like, no, no, it, it you know, I'm just going to blame this person. And that's right. I mean, I, they did it right. Let's, let's own that. So talk to, talk to us about blame and responsibility and how those are, are not really the same. Right. That's a, that's a great point because for me, it's one of the things that, if you get anything out of my message and out of the book, to me, that is the biggest takeaway that I want people to have. Because when you look at it, you know, I talked to, you know, I've been talking to leaders, I'm, you know, had, um, you know, podcasts that I've been on and presentations that I've given. And as I talk to leaders about this idea, you know, they'll ask me, it's okay, well, you know, I like the idea of, you know, getting rid of blame, but then how do we make sure that we're holding people accountable and people are still going to act responsibly. And I let them know, like, those are completely different terms. And so the definition that I found that I like the most for blame is that it is resentment that we feel towards someone or something that we hold at fault for a misfortune. Right. And if you want to shorten that down, because that's a mouthful, you can just say blame is resentment. And so when you understand that, then all of a sudden you, you can realize and you can accept that, hey, maybe it's not useful and maybe it's not just that it's not useful, but it's actually damaging for us to accept blame in our workplace. And then responsibility is just taking ownership, right? We're being responsible for like the words that are coming out of my mouth right now. I'll, I'll take ownership of those. And if I do anything inappropriate with that, Phil, I'm going to give you the power to hold me accountable to that, right? And so that, that's what accountability is, is to be held accountable for, you know, your actions or your words. And so, you know, blame, responsibility, and accountability then are three completely different things. And so you, in order to hold people responsible and hold them accountable, then we're going to have to know what happened. And so in that case, then it's not just about, hey, we're just trying to relieve some pressure after a failure and we're going to take some executive action and fire somebody. We're actually going to take a hard look at objectively what occurred so that, you know, if there are things that were done wrong, we can hold certain people accountable. And in the most cases, um, as uh, uh, Edwards Deming said that, you know, I think it's 94% of performance variance is because of systems and processes, not because of people, right? And so some of that objective analysis is going to show us, hey, there's some, something in our system that's wrong. You know, there's something in our processes that can be adjusted. And then occasionally there might be something that a person, an individual is doing that has to be adjusted as well. But a lot of times those issues are going to be systems and processes instead. And so uh, just understanding that whole idea of what blame is, that it is resentment and that it actually gets in the way of holding people accountable. It gets in the way of people acting responsibly, right? And just having that clarity, I think, is a big benefit to uh, work culture. Yeah, I, I think there's a huge benefit there. I think we need to remember that resentment is, uh, resentment is poison that hurts us a lot. And it holds us back from that. And ownership is a big thing. One of my early people that I got uh, mentored by, I guess I learned from Dick Strong, I always said, think like an owner, take ownership of everything that you do. And that was really powerful. And then the, the resentment thing. I mean, yeah, I don't know anybody who actively works to screw stuff up. So why would we resent them for making a mistake for, for, uh, maybe not meeting standards or for following a process that they thought was right and actually was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a good example of that is uh, Jeff Lawson at Twilio. 
said that at one point, you know, they, they create um, tools for uh, software developers. And so at one point, Uber was their largest client. And they had Uber called them up and said, hey, we're going to scale back the work that we're doing with you guys significantly. It was so significant that when they announced it, then Twilio stock tumbled by about 40% in one day, right? So it was a huge deal. And so he was a CEO and he feels like I've got to do something about this. And his initial thought was whoever is in charge of Uber, they're fired, right? And then his better senses took control and he thought, you know, wait a minute. I'm not going to just have a knee jerk reaction here. Let's find out what actually happened. And so they investigated it and he wanted to objectively understand what took, what took place and what led to Uber, you know, pulling back on the work that they were doing. And when they looked at it, they understood that, oh, wait, we have one account manager. They've got about 30 accounts that they're having to manage and Uber is one of those 30 accounts. So if I fire that person, then, that's the opposite of what I actually need to do because we actually need more people working on these accounts so we can distribute the work more evenly and they're not so overwhelmed. And that's what they did. They actually hired more people. And then instead of their company shrinking after Uber had, you know, reduced the amount of work they were doing with them, they actually grew by fivefold in a short period of time. And Lawson said that he attributes most of that to their practice of what he called blameless postmortems. So they would actually look at the issues without using blame and objectively analyzing what the issue was, just like he did with Uber. And that helped his company grow more because of that, because they eliminated blame. Wow. Wow. So it, you've made it really clear that we need to remove blame. Why don't we, though, Dustin? What, get, what are the roadblocks? What are the obstacles that get in our way from having a blameless culture? Right. So, you know, one of the things, not to get, you know, go back to the Bible, but uh, when I talk about the Garden of Eden and that story, it's, you know, this story of, um, you know, man sinning. You got Adam and Eve, you know, according to the story, they're the only two people in creation, right? And then they're not supposed to eat of one fruit, right? They can eat of any other tree in the Garden of Eden, and what do they do? Of course, they go for the, the forbidden fruit, right? We have that, that term because of that. And so then God confronts them in this story. And when he does, what happens, right? Adam just says, oh, you know what? I screwed up. I messed up. Let me own and take responsibility, right? No, he doesn't do that. So he blames Eve instead and said that she tricked him. And then Eve, you know, you only have two people in all existence. Of course, you know, she has to take that responsibility at that point, right? And she doesn't. Right. She take, she instead blames the serpent. And so you look at that and you think, OK, so then disobeying God is that original sin. And I want to say, well, maybe not. Maybe that's not the point of the story. Exactly. Maybe the point is blaming someone else, shifting the blame, not taking responsibility for one's own actions is that original sin instead. And then if you look at how many cultures, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, Judeo-Christian culture, you look at uh, the Jewish culture, and you look at Muslim cultures, like they have that as part of their, you know, a, a, a origin story within their religion. And that's over half the population of the earth follows one of those three religions. So all of us see that as being integral to who we are as individuals. And part of the reason why we don't want to, you know, accept responsibility and we tend to blame others. Part of that is because we don't want others to see that we, we are flawed, right? We don't want to expose our flawed selves. Brene Brown talks a lot. I mean, that woman has done so well and started her career off because she tapped into our fear of vulnerability, right? And that is so you know, global that it you know, has shot her up into uh, psychological stardom, basically. But she's tapped into something that is, you know, just a core human fear that we all have. And I think that also relates to blame as well. Because of that fear of vulnerability, we don't want to accept blame. And um, when someone hurts us or embarrasses us also, we feel like there has to be some sort of recompense for that, right? We need somebody hurts us, we have to retaliate. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about these societies and that back and forth infighting that happens, right? When someone hurts us, we want to hurt them. And we use blame as a weapon in those moments. And we use it to try to, you know, 
restore justice in our own minds, but it's a twisted form of justice instead. And if that person doesn't necessarily even have to be guilty in order for us to blame them, we just have to feel like they're guilty, you know? And so those are some of the things that cause us to, you know, utilize blame pretty much on a universal level. Wow. Wow. That's super powerful. And it, it really good illustration of blame and all of that so so with that this sounds good man but is this actual does this actually lead to profitability dustin yeah so these are the things that you you know i just shared the story about twilio right and so you had a company that really took a big hit and if they had uh you know just reacted in that situation and utilized blame in that situation and just fired that account manager then in more, you know, it's very likely they wouldn't have had the success that they had in that. And, you know, when you look at, you know, there's a author, Amy Edmondson, who's talked about psychological safety. Um, and there's been other organizational psychologists that have presented that concept. And they show how, you know, by creating psychological safety in organizations, you're able to enhance the productivity, creativity, and innovation of your organization. And there's a great book called Created Confidence um, by the Kelly brothers who um, have IDEO as a, as a design firm uh, that is globally known for you know their design thinking. And part of the reason why they're able to be so successful with that is they create that creative confidence in their organization. And they have taken on and embraced that idea of creating psycholo psychological safety in, uh, in their company. And it's taken off and it's grown their company um, by multi mul multitudes. And so you see it in organization over an organization that by uh, avoiding this culture of blame, by creating psychological safety, that they're able to be more innovative, more creative, more productive. And they're able to attract better talent because of that. They're able to retain that talent and they're able to get that talent to engage in work that matters because they're eliminating blame. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah. Get rid of the blame. Get rid of the resentment and start with the ownership. So with that, folks, if you want to get more from Dustin, before we wrap up here, I want to encourage you to go to blamethisbook.com. You can learn more from Dustin. He's got a great book there. He's got a picture of it behind him. I listen to the audio book. It is fantastic so with that dustin i'm gonna give you the kind of final say here my friend how do we get started removing the blame from organizations how do we get started with more ownership right so you know i think the first thing is really kind of what we talked about early on about creating that clarity right and it's not just something for leaders it's for you know individual contributors as well that I believe that no matter where you are on the organizational chart, that leadership is all about getting other people to follow you, right? And so you can do that from anywhere on an organizational chart. And so if you're wanting to try to help create a culture that moves away from blame, or if you're wanting to work on the blame habit yourself, I think the first thing is getting that clarity about what blame is and that it is resentment and it is not beneficial to you as an individual or to an organization. And uh, one of the quotes that I like to use is that um, hanging on to blame is like drinking a poison, waiting for the other person to die, right? It only, it hurts yourself, right? Um, and so creating that clarity is a huge thing, understanding blame, responsibility, and accountability. The other thing is uh, to be inclusive, right? And we talk about that in a lot of different ways, uh, but the idea is that it's easier for us to scapegoat others when we believe that they're not one of us. And so when we support inclusivity in our organizations, then it makes it harder for us to wield blame as a weapon. Uh, the other thing we can do is to challenge our assumptions because blame thrives in an environment where we have a um, confirmation bias, where we make assumptions early on and we don't allow new evidence to change our minds, right? And so in the book, I talk about the case of Amanda Knox and that she was the perfect scapegoat because in her case, she was a foreigner, an American in Italy. 
and that there is this pre-existing narrative that the authorities created that she was a femme fatale. And so it was sensational. The media caught on to it. And so as new evidence came in and it contradicted their assumptions, they didn't accept it because of that confirmation bias, right? And so that's why they went down the wrong path and actually convicted her of a murder that she didn't commit and she was later exonerated from. And then the, the last thing I would say is to recognize um, the temptation to simply relieve pressure after a mistake or a failure. And that our goal after a mistake or failure shouldn't be just to relieve that pressure that builds up after that occurs. And th because we may follow one mistake with another one. And instead, like Jeff Lawson at Twilio, we need to step back and look at objectively, what can we do differently? I, I outline how you can do a blameless postmortem in the book and uh, utilize that in order to actually root out the root cause of the issue and fix that. Otherwise, you make a mistake, you blame somebody, and then all these organizations will see, you know, a month or two or a year or two down the road, the same situation comes up again and they make the same mistake because they never addressed the root cause of their problem. Well, that blameless self mortem makes the book worth it all in itself. But the rest of the stuff is great, too. I love your suggestions, creating clarity, being inclusive, challenging our assumptions, and then recognize the temptation to just relieve pressure. Great stuff, Dustin. Again, folks, if you want to get more from Dustin, go to blamethisbook.com or his website is also thepeoplepro.com, which is where we initially connected many, many years ago. So thanks, Dustin, for sharing some insight. And folks, don't blame the book. Take ownership instead. Recognize that that is much healthier. Thanks, Dustin.